Today on A Novel Review, a mantelpiece moment that reflects the continuation of the human experience in comparison to the rest of the world. Part 2 of delving into one of the greatest novels ever written. And, as always, what novel am I pulling down from that precarious pile on my bedside table? All of that and more today on A Novel Review. Hello and welcome to the literature podcast, A Novel Review. My name is Seamus, your host, and together we will discuss, dissect, and explore the wonderful world of literature, and the wonderful world of literature is a vast and dense jungle, so let's start making our way through, one book at a time. Hello, hello, and welcome to the beginning of another episode of A Novel Review. My name is Seamus, and I am your host, and for today's episode, part two of The Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky. But before I jump back into this book, I always take a moment to reflect on any mantelpiece moments, something to highlight from the week past. And this week, a quote from a novel entitled Gaudy Nights by Dorothy L. Sayers that is beautifully, perhaps even terrifyingly complex. The novel itself, I had a brief look at it, and it looks to be quite interesting. So I've also put that on my list of books to acquire and then to read, if you've ever heard of it. I had not, but you know that, that pile of books to be read grows weekly, so please don't hold me to that. Uh, but anyways, I'm sort of getting sidetracked here. Here is the quote. How fleeting are all human passions compared with the massive continuity of ducks? Yes, that is the actual quote, and naturally, I loved this quote when I read it. Ducks, or a single duck rather, as you may or may not have noticed, is the cover art for this podcast, and what the quote is getting at is how 100, 200, 300, 400 years ago, all ducks wanted and needed was food and a pond to swim in, and yet man, you know, men and women from 1, 2, 3, 400 years ago would not just simply be confused by us in the present day, but terrified. You know, this is a time when there's no smartphones, there's no internet, you know, telephones don't even exist. Terrified because we're almost alien to them. There is probably something existential in that, some internal fear that we as humans fail to reconcile, and, you know, there's an unhappiness, perhaps, because all ducks want is a pond. I'll leave that to the philosophers to discuss and write about. For now, I'm just thinking about ducks. But I can't do this forever. It is time to move along because we have another philosophical work to discuss. But first, housekeeping as always. All the scripts from the episode are available on my website just in case you know of anyone who has a hearing impairment who might get a kick out of a written version of the pods. So head along. They are all free for use for all to enjoy. Also, all the episodes are on YouTube, with closed captions of course, if that is more your cup of tea. Where were we? Somewhere about in the middle of The Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky. In the last episode, I finished the episode itself by talking about the great chapter, The Grand Inquisitor. And it was a great place to end... But now we have to pick up the reins, continue, and move on. But just before we do, a quick recap. Previously on a novel review, The Brothers Karamazov is about the lives of three brothers, each sharing a terrible father who is a bit of a dick. The story is mostly following the youngest, Aloysia, who is religious and is quite proud of his faith. The middle child is Ivan, who is atheist and I guess you could say cold and calculating in his rational and how he conducts himself. The eldest son is Dimitri, who is a bit of a loose cannon like his father. Dimitri also hates his father, with a great tension brewing between them over inheritance that the father Fyodor owes to Dimitri. Fyodor, of course, refutes this claim. Overall, for me, the novel is an exploration of responsibility what it looks like on paper, and how that translates into action. 
this is a very, very brief overview, and I would encourage you to listen to episode one, because like, well, why wouldn't you? So let's crack on. Aloysia, still at this stage in the novel, has yet to return to Father Zosima, but then he does, and I think it's actually really quite timely. He has been racing around, and as I said, it was quite stressful because I wanted him to make it back before Zosima dies. And ironically, a lot of the conversations he's been having are about responsibility. Thankfully, Loisha takes responsibility and charge of the situation, returning to Zosima. And thank God, Zosima is not dead yet. And so what we get is some more juicy Zosima content. I would sum it up, but I mean, why bother? Let's just have a quote from him and be glad we got some more Zosima content. So here is some wonderful wisdom that Zosima is able to impart upon us before he departs the world. And the quote goes, There is only one means of salvation. Then take yourself and make yourself responsible for all men's sins. That is the truth, you know, friends. For as soon as you sincerely make yourself responsible for everything and for all men, you will see at once that it is really so, and that you are to blame for everything and for all things. But throwing your own indolence and impotence on others, you will end by sharing the pride of Satan and murmurings against God. Of the pride of Satan, what I think is this. It is hard for us on earth to comprehend it, and therefore it is so easy to fall into error and to share it, even imagining that we are doing something grand and fine. End quote. Mm. Make yourself responsible for everything and for all men. We exist in the world, and so we are responsible for the world. Don't be indolent. Don't be lazy. You need to be honest with yourself about your own life. There are shades of Raina Maria Rilke in there. We must go inwards and be honest about who we are and what we want. But most of all, be responsible for your world and all that exists within it. I've of course only read this once, this, this book once. But I think as I cast my mind back, Zosima is my favourite character. That might change on a second read, but at the moment... I think he is the character I would most like to be. Now, I personally, I am not religious, but I feel Zosima has this duality between faith and reason. Aloysia is faith-driven while Avan is calculated and breaks life down into conversations to try win. But Zosima is faith-driven, but this faith is calculated and in tune with human desire. In this part of the novel, after the death of Zosima, The town believes that his body will not decompose because he was so holy in nature. This, of course, is not the case. Surprise, surprise. And his body begins to decompose almost immediately after he dies, which is interesting because it changes people's perceptions of who Zosima was and what he preached about. And it reminds me of this short story by Kurt Vonnegut titled Sinbad, that details the life of someone, and basically, it's a story about how we as humans remember how people died, rather than how they lived and what they achieved. And the Brothers Karamazov embodies this, with people now trying to sway Aloysia away from his faith, all because of Zosima's decaying body. But this only serves to solidify Aloysia's faith, which is really, really nice. But... As Zosima has shuffled along, it is time for us to shuffle along to the main body of the novel, which might sound a bit absurd given that we are a hefty way into episode 2, and of course a hefty way into the novel, but that's just the way the cookie crumbles sometimes. Owing money to his fiancée, Dmitri wants to repay her, to be rid of her and then run off with his lover Grushenka. But as a poor and desperate sensualist, He feels a gripping desperation. A desperation to not only be financially viable, but also to be with Grushenka, who Dmitri fears might run off with his father due to his lavish, lavish wealth. 
This becomes a really curious part of the novel because there is some discontinuity in the story that renders everything moving forward unreliable. After thinking that Grushenka has abandoned him for his father, Dmitri runs to his father's house and spies him through the window, Dmitri himself holding a brass pestle, and then the information gets foggy. The next solid thing that we as the reader are made aware of is that Dmitri is running from his father's house. But then the servant of the house Grigory is yelling at the top of his voice, yelling patricide, which makes us as the readers assume that that is what has happened. Dmitri hits him on the head and thinks that he has killed him. He tries to attend the wound with his handkerchief, but abandons this and flees the scene. Dmitri then finds Grushenka and they indulge in a riot of a party, drinking heavily and right as they are about to plan their marriage, Dmitri is arrested for the murder of his father. But from here the novel actually takes a really interesting turn. It becomes almost a murder mystery because the text was deliberately vague about what happened at that moment of Fyodor being killed. When in custody, at least for me, I was so uncertain as to what the truth was, which is the beautiful part of this novel. You rise to ideas so certain that you know what is going on before being taken back down in only a few lines. Dmitri is adamant that he is innocent, and at first you think, how? He went to his house in rage. He went to his father's house in rage. He left his father's house covered in blood. His father is murdered. The evidence is stacked against him, and at first I thought, okay, this should be fun. A guilty man tries to convince us that he is innocent, and this will probably be his decline into madness. Except... That is not what happens in a sense. Dimitri, the whole novel has seemed to me an outrageous character, you know, this sensualist. And now suddenly he is calm, rational, and almost calculated in his word choice. And so he lays out his initial defense while being questioned by the police. And the doubt starts to creep into my mind about whether he didn't commit the murder. Though surely he did. And yet... What is fascinating about this part is Dmitri assumes responsibility for so much and yet denies the murder wholeheartedly, but also manages to dent it with reasoned thoughts that you actually are unsure of. Still, the evidence is against him and it does seem insurmountable and he is to remain in prison until the trial. The town becomes kind of consumed by this trial. I guess... Everyone loves some indirect drama. I mean, who doesn't, to be fair? But Ivan, leading up to the trial, tries to figure out who the murderer is of his father. Three times Ivan visits Smerdikov, who is the illegitimate son of Fyodor and also lives with him. And on the third time, Smerdikov confesses to the murder of Fyodor, thus making Dmitri innocent. But, and this is the kicker, Smerdikov is confused by Ivan who acts shocked to hear that it was in fact Smerdikov who had killed him because he claims that Ivan actually partook in the murder through influence, mostly through instilling the belief that a world without God means that everything is permitted, coupled with Ivan's insistence on when he would be leaving the house, thus making the coast clear for him to, to commit the act itself in peace. And here we are, at the crux of the novel. A novel about responsibility, but the responsibility is that of murder. The novel becomes this really close analysis, this really pointed and acute analysis of how people can be involved in an act that is universally viewed as atrocious. Avan, though he did not commit the act physically, is involved. It is not just who pulled the trigger, but it's how you might have contributed to this atrocity. It goes back and back to that wonderful quote, everyone is responsible for everyone's sin. If you live in a society, you are responsible for that society. If you participate in society, you are responsible for it. You are not directly removed from atrocities because if these things happen in a world that you exist, you play a part. 
you can't look down on poor people because, I mean, one, that would be a terrible, terrible thing to do. But the main point is, is because they are poor in the society that you live in. So something in that society has failed this person that you are continuing to act in and thus perpetrate. Ivan falls into madness. He is the intelligent one, the rational one. He is the one that can talk the pants off a nun. He is calculating and his rationale makes sense on paper. Aloysia does not have responses to him, cannot argue his factually driven credences, and yet Aloysia and his love and faith are the victors. The novel comes to a slightly sombre ending with Dimitri being found guilty of murder and sent to hard labour in Siberia, though they are making plans for his escape. Ivan has gone insane at the hands of his own mind, and Aloysia has his faith. The hope for me in the novel comes from this idea that Dostoevsky puts forth that you can get salvation from the evil you commit, not in the religious way of repenting and you will go to heaven kind of way, that is incredibly simplistic I know, but in the way that you get salvation here and now. Responsibility of the self is needed now, and so salvation from our mistakes can come now too. Can we live well in the face of these evils? Can we take responsibility for our actions and understand how our actions go out into the world? Aeschylus explores a similar theme in his Orestian trilogy, of which I have done three episodes on, so go and read and listen to those episodes as well, because, you know, more content. But you have to understand and be aware of not just the immediate effect of your actions, but understand how your actions influence as they spin out into the world. It is also an idea that Agatha Christie employs in her final Poirot novel, Curtain, Poirot's Last Mystery. I don't want to spoil that book for anyone, but it's a novel about what responsibility does everyone have to the influences of a murderer. I think, in conclusion, what I loved about this book was that I took it to be a novel about responsibility, but you could take it as a novel about faith or hatred, murder, a mystery novel of sorts, an anti-religious novel of other sorts, just a good read. What I'm trying to say is there are so many narratives, so many layers to this novel that you might have had a completely different read to me and come to a completely different conclusion. I know I will reread this book and I can't wait to, but I have to wait Because I know in a few years' time when I reread this book as a different person, it will be a different book. What would I rate this novel out of five? That, that's a tough one. It's a damn near-perfect novel and it deserves to be read slowly and thoughtfully. I think I'm going to have to give it a 4.9 out of five. But don't think that because it's not a solid five that it isn't perfect. That is just because I reserve the five for those special few books that are beyond literature for me. So 4.9 it is. Get a copy of this book, a pen or pencil, sticky notes, a notepad, and read, read, read. So what am I reading this week? This week, I am reading another big book. What a time to announce it. Announce it? Yeah, I guess so. Announce it. The Hunchback of Notre Dame by Victor Hugo. I'm actually listening to it, full disclosure, because the narrator is a man called Bill Homewood, and he is just brilliant. He also narrates a version of The Count of Monte Cristo, which is so good. It's it's conflicting because I love reading that book, but his narration is just so indulgent, and it's You know, I'm going to be honest, it's this indulgent sort of narration style that was the only thing that held me to the story, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, in the early stages. There was, and I'm going to tell this to you guys now, there was this funny moment early in the novel. A conversation between two characters briefly discussing a house that has been recently rented out in central Paris for six livres and eight sols, which is the currency of the day in France. And... I mean, if the dodgy website I used for inflation calculations was correct, that equates to around $200 a year. $200 rent for a house in central Paris. That is not the funny part. Not yet. 
The funny part comes in the next line when the character complains how rents are rising. How rents are rising. Hmm. I wonder if Mr. Hugo understood the joke he was making even in those days. But still, the book itself has picked up its pace, and I mean, I'm very excited to see where it goes, so stay tuned for that. Now, before I close out the show, if you have listened this far, please consider hitting those five stars. I would really appreciate it. Also, feel free to head along to the website and support the pod. And as always, thank you, thank you, thank you for your attention. So I think it's time to end this episode. And today, to take us away, I think a bit of Susan Sontag and this lovely little line. Time exists in order that everything doesn't happen all at once. And space exists so that it doesn't all happen to you. 